So um, just to introduce myself, um, my name is Louise. I am a software engineer in Optum. Um, for those of you that don't know, Optum is a part of United Health Group and we are a healthcare technology company. Um, I'm working on the machine learning team at the moment. And the topic that I want to talk about today is something that I think is really fundamental with the growing rise of artificial intelligence applications. So I'm going to discuss bias in artificial intelligence, how a lack of diversity can bias AI systems. Obviously, the scope of this topic is really, really broad. There's so much involved in it. So for the purpose of fitting it into around 25 minutes, I'm going to just kind of narrow the scope into um, gender diversity and gender bias as that's an area that I'm particularly passionate about and interested in, both as a woman in tech and someone that is working with machine learning. So I'm going to cover the gender data gap, gender balance in the workforce, bias in AI, and some potential solutions for this problem. Just to get an idea, how many people have heard the term the gender data gap before? Okay, a few people, not too bad. So basically, the gender data gap is the phenomenon that most of the data that we have collected in the world is biased around the male life pattern and male bodies. There's this idea in the world of design um, of the reference man, which is said to represent the standard human. Um, the male perspective and experience is seen as universal, as the default, and then the female body is seen as niche or atypical or other. Um, this can cause problems where we see that simply one size does not fit all. This is quite a literal example where I'm sure you will have all seen in the news just a few months ago, the NASA all-female spacewalk was cancelled because they didn't have enough space seats to properly fit the women. And there are countless examples of just how detrimental it can be um, when this data gap comes into account and we don't take the perspectives of females into account in the design process. So this impact can be relatively minor, for example, this is what it feels like when I hold my mobile phone. So I, I'm not even exaggerating. I, I can't use my phone with one hand. I have to use two hands. Um, and on average, women actually drop their phones more often than men. And it's not because we're more clumsy. It's because the smartphone has simply become too large for the average size of a female hand. So that's a rather lighthearted example. But of course, there are a lot more serious and even life-threatening problems as well with this gender data gap. So heart attacks present differently in men than in women. So only one in eight women um, experience the classic pain in chest, kind of Hollywood symptom of a heart attack. And because of this, um, women are 60% more likely to be misdiagnosed when they present with a heart attack than men. Um, in addition to this, female subjects are often excluded from clinical trials. So women are more likely to suffer um, adverse effects from medication and to die from these adverse effects. Um, the differences in women's cells, hormones and physiology has failed to be taken to, into account and this in the study of disease, pain and illness and this leads to symptoms being brushed aside and treatments that are actually less effective for women than for men. And this kind of last example was probably the one that was most shocking to me. So cars are only required to be safety tested with a male anthropomorphic crash jump test dummy. Um, and as a direct consequence of this, in a car crash, women are 18% more likely to die and 47% more likely to be severely injured. So that was just mind blowing to me. I just, yeah, that, I just thought that that was really, a really stark example. Bias can be introduced into the data collection phase in two main ways. So either the data is unrepresentative of reality or the data reflects existing prejudices. We're now seeing AI applications commonly be used to um, conduct job interviews, approve loan applications, aid medical diagnoses, um, screen CVs. But these systems may have been trained using data sets that are riddled with data gaps. And because most AI software is proprietary, we have no way of knowing whether these data gaps have been taken into account.
It's no secret that there is a huge lack of gender diversity in the tech world, both in Ireland and abroad. And the figures usually work out at roughly one in four of the people working in tech are female. And when we narrow in on the AI sector, the problem worsens. So there's a massive de diversity crisis. Women make up 18% of authors at leading AI conferences, less than 20% of AI professors, 15% of AI research staff at Google, or sorry, at Facebook, and 10% at Google. So why is this lack of gender diversity a problem for AI? Well, as well as being biased by biased training set, by biased training data, AI systems can be shaped by the environment in which they are created. Um, at the moment, most large-scale AI systems are created in a small number of tech companies and elite uh, university labs. And in the West, these spaces tend to be extremely white, extremely male, and extremely affluent. Um, systems can inadvertently reflect the biases of their creators. And when you have systems that are be being created by this homogenous group of people, um, it's very difficult for them to like take into the account the d diverse perspectives and needs of society and it just makes the likelihood that this bias is going to creep in all that more large. From a high level view, AI systems function as systems of discrimination. But this discrimination is not evenly distributed. While they are classification technologies that rank, categorise and differentiate, um, when bias creeps into these technologies, it can mirror and replicate existing structures of inequalities in society. Such systems are repeating patterns of racial and gender bias in a way that can deepen and justify historical inequality. And I think that the commercial deployment of these tools is a cause for great concern. I've done a lot of research into applications that have shown bias, signs of bias in natural language processing, or NLP. So Amazon was working with a CV or a resume screening tool. However, the system began to downgrade CVs that had any mention of the applicant being a woman. So for example, if the applicant went to an all-female college or was a member of a women's swim team, um, the CV would be downgraded. When engineers revised the system, the um, AI system still began to discriminate against words that were implicitly gendered. Um, that is, they are highly correlated with uh, women over men, such as um, collaborative or supportive. And in the end, Amazon had to scrap the tool because they couldn't, they couldn't prove that it wasn't discriminating against women. Gender discrimination was built too deeply into the tool and into Amazon's past hiring practices. Um, for the situation to be resolved. Um, there's also dictionaries that are trained, that are consisting of corpora of dominantly male data. And this leads to situations where we have voice recognition systems that perform better on male voices than on female voices. Um, some of you may be familiar with the word to vec word embedding algorithm. So. Um, this um, algorithm, you can, you can query the vector space and you can ask it things like Japan is to Tokyo as um, France is to X and it will return Paris. Or you can ask man is to king as woman is to and it will return queen. However, some of the analogies that it was returning were actually found to be biased. So uh, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with some of these. I think they always make headlines. Um, it will return man is to doctor as woman is to nurse and man is to programmer as woman is to homemaker. So yeah, I think that's very commonly cited. Um, when researchers did some further investigation into the algorithm, they found that there was actually a constraint that said that the algorithm could never return the same term as the first, so you could never actually get a man is to programmer as woman is to programmer. Um, it was, it was a, a kind of a performance um, safeguard so that you, could, you wouldn't get like the situation where Japan is to Tokyo as France is to Tokyo. Um, so when this constraint was removed, um, the algorithm performance decreased, but it did become fairer. So. 
Similarly, in facial recognition systems, bias has been uncovered. So the 2018 Gender Shades paper um, examined three commercial facial recognition systems um, that were able to categorise faces by gender. And the um, systems, all three systems, had higher error rates for darker skinned women um, than for any other group and the lowest error rates for light skinned males. The recognition tool was one of the tools that were included in the paper. When we examine the roots of this unequal representation, we are led to the data sets that the systems are trained on, which are composed of um, dominantly male and white faces. So the labeled faces in the wild data set contains over 15,000 images of faces, but only 7% are images of black people. Likewise, um, another study shows that gender bias is built into two large uh, sets of photos, which are released to help software better understand the content of images, um, including one supported by Microsoft and Facebook. Um, so researchers looked at in situ and Coco. So each collection contains more than 100,000 images of complex scenes um, that have been gleaned from the web. And they're all labeled with descriptions. Um, both data sets contain many more images of men than women. And there was also a large um, gender bias associated with the content of the labeled images. So um, images of shopping and cooking were strongly linked to women, whereas images of coaching and shooting were commonly linked to men. Um, in the Coco data set, um, objects like you would find in the kitchen, like forks and spoons, were linked and strongly associated with women, um, while outdoor sporting equipment was linked to males. When image recognition software is trained on data sets like this, the bias is actually amplified. So a system trained on the COCO data set associated computers and keyboards much more strongly with men than the data set did itself. Um, the algorithm would more often than not see a photo of a kitchen and associate it with women and not men. Um, and the researchers paper actually included a picture of a man in the kitchen that the algorithm lamed, uh, labeled as a woman. Many AI systems don't have user-facing interfaces at all. Instead, they are integrated into the background of decision-making processes, unseen and often unknown to the lives and opportunities that they, that they influence. And all the examples I've talked about point to a larger problem. It's not just that um, systems need to be fixed when they misrecognize faces. It's that they're perpetuating existing forms of structural inequality, even when working is intended. So the Facebook ad delivery mechanism was actually shown to um, be giving users ads um, for housing and for um, professions in a discriminatory manner. So it was presenting images that aligned with gender and racial stereotypes. So for example, white males were shown ads for jobs in the lumber industry. Um, females were shown ads for um, positions as cashiers in supermarkets and black users were shown ads for jobs as taxi drivers. Um, I also want to note the relationship between these workplaces with discriminatory practices and discriminatory tools. So going back to the example of the Amazon uh, CV screening tool, so when you're training a system on historical data that has evidence of like discriminatory or prejudicial behavior, such as um, favoring men over women for the employment of technical roles. This is an example of when your data set is reflecting existing prejudices. Um, and then to have a data set then that's not representative of reality, I think label faces in the wild is a good example of this, where it didn't um, accurately reflect the um, racial and gender distribution of the population. Um, and when we look back to where these images actually were sourced from, so label faces in the wild, the images were gleaned from images of the media landscape in the early 2000s. Um, and at the time, the media landscape was mostly um, kind of figures of white males who were in positions of celebrity and power. Um, so in a way, this, um, this data set is kind of a reflection of the early 2000s 
social hierarchy, but represented through visual media. So I'm hoping now that you'll agree with me that there is a problem there and it like, has been backed up by a lot of research. So how do we go about fixing this? I think there's two main areas that need to be focused on. So we need to collect gender disaggregated data and we need more women and diverse workers in the AI field. If we have a more diverse workforce, this will provide us with additional perspectives and fail safes um, and allow us to more accurately reflect a diverse and inclusive society. There are so many ways that you can improve workplace diversity. So um, one big step is to publish compensation levels broken down by race and by gender ending pay and opportunity inequality, publish harassment and discrimination transparency reports, eliminating any evidence of unconscious bias from hiring practices and commit to transparency around these hiring practices. Um, increasing the number of underrepresented groups at senior leadership level has also been shown to be very beneficial. And I think that it's also really important to have buy-in from senior leadership with these initiatives. And finally, in areas where AI research is being carried out, um, diversity is absolutely essential. And there are multiple benefits of having a diverse workforce. So you can benefit from higher employee engagement. Um, because a diverse workforce is better able to represent the customer, um, you will also see improved product targeting. Companies with more females in senior, le in senior leadership have increased profitabil profitability and revenue. And when you have additional perspectives and ideas, um, that will allow you to bring increased creativity to the board. And of course, it's always favorable for a company's reputation. Moving back to a biased data set. So what are we going to do with all of these, these, these data sets that seemingly contain bias? So the obvious first step is to collect more data. However, this may not always be possible, particularly if you're not the, 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 the department that's in charge of data collection or if you're using an external data set. Um, so in that case, um, you can potentially look at pre-processing. So um, perhaps it's possible to resample, upsample, downsample the data. Um, this obviously depends on how imbalanced the data set, it, data set is. So with the la label faces in the wild data set, it will be extremely difficult with only 7% um, of the, the um, minority class. Um, it also could be an idea to remove any characteristics from the data set that could introduce bias. So remove um, mentions of any age, gender, um, even things that aren't necessarily intuitive, like zip code could um, provide information about the um, subject's affluency or race. Um, profession could um, provide information about the user's um, gender. There's also been um, uh, some work done around debiasing algorithms. So in the paper that um, investigated the word to VEC word embedding algorithm, the, um, the researchers did manage to, um, to do some work with the weights and to, um, well, they reported removed bias from the algorithm. Uh, MIT is doing some research around type of deep neural net called variational autoencoders. And I think there's also been some work around adversarial learning, which could be used um, in this format. And there is also some open source bias toolkits, which are already becoming available. So Facebook has released one called Fairness Flow. Um, IBM has a Python package called AI Fairness 360. Um, what if is an open source visualization toolkit from Google um, and it can be used with TensorBoard, Jupyter Notebook, um, lots of other platforms and it allows you to change certain information about the subject such as zip code and age and then you can um, assess whether or not the decision um, or the prediction of the model was affected by this. Um, Accenture is also working on a cloud toolkit and this is not actually a, a toolkit, the last one, Microsoft Face API. However, I thought it was important to note that this June um, of 2019, Microsoft consulted an explainability AI expert, and they actually increased 
the size of their data set that they use to train their face recognition API, face API. So I thought that this was a really positive step and I just wanted to, to mention it. There's also other steps that you can take to address bias and discrimination in AI systems. So it's very difficult to de detect bias in an opaque system. So transparency is essential and I think that explainable AI is going to become very, very popular. Um, rigorous testing should be acquired, required across the life cycle of all AI systems, particularly those um, in sensitive domains such as in healthcare. And it's also not enough just to look at the technical debiasing side of algorithms. Um, I think that a wider social analysis of how AI is used in context should be required. And along the same lines, I think we should always conduct a risk, risk assessment and ask ourselves the questions, should certain systems be designed at all? So I know that a lot of what I've talked about in this presentation has been quite negative and there's been a lot of very sobering facts and figures, but I do want to end on a positive note. Um, so these efforts that I've mentioned by um, these large global companies, while they are small and they're only the beginning, I do think that it is a step in the right direction. And I think that investigating bias in AI could actually be good for us um, as on a, in society as a whole, because it will force us to actually think about our own unconscious biases um, and perhaps make us think fair and think in a different and more diverse way. So that's all for me anyway. So thank you very much for coming on this very rainy Sunday morning. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Uh, we still have time for a few minutes. Sure. Um, that was fantastic. Um, oh, thank you. Mentioned you. that um, females are often excluded from medical trials. Yeah. Um, so why is that? So I think the initial thinking was that because um, females' hormones tend to vary. Um, tend to, sorry, tend to vary a lot more, that that made them more, dif more difficult to study because um, you don't have like a consistent state. Um, there was also concerns about if the woman was pregnant, there could be, you know, um, harm done to the baby. But I think that it's, it's absolutely ridiculous and I think that it needs to be completely changed because there's so many medications that um, could have adverse effects um, on women because they simply just aren't studied. Um, for example, um, you know, the way if someone's having a heart attack, you're advised to give them aspirin. But this study, these studies haven't actually been carried out on a large set of women. So it actually may be harmful for some women to be given aspirin in the time of a heart attack. So it really is just um, mind boggling. And there's a really large set um, of women that medication just will have absolutely no effect on, um, which is, yeah, it's, it's mind boggling to me, but um, hopefully we'll see increased regulations around it soon. Hi. Um, you mentioned briefly that there is research looking into specific algorithms like variational autoencoders. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is that looking at improving the actual bias of the algorithm itself, or is it looking at being able to generate new um, data points, new images to improve uh, the sample distribution of data sets? So um, my understanding of it is that they look at the model itself and they'll kind of play around with like the weights and try and firstly detect bias and then compensate for any bias. Um, I don't know if it's going to be able to change um, the data sets necessarily themselves. I think it's more a way to compensate for the data sets having bias in them. I would recommend you reading the MIT paper yeah, though, because it it's a deep dive and I've not necessarily gotten stuck in there yet, but um, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay. Can I make a question? Yeah, of course. So, uh, in my understanding, there are uh, cases where we want to discriminate between men and women, as sure. in the heart attack example, and sometimes we don't want to discriminate them, like in the program example. Instance, yeah, exactly. We both have should have the right of being programs. Um, how do you think could be a good uh, categorization for the two things? So yeah, that's a really good example. Um, so that's why I think it's important to have this gender dis disaggregated data so that we know this study came from males and this study came from women. But then it comes back to thinking about is gender essential in this, um, in this model? Um, with the example of word embedding algorithms, it's, it's not really. Um, with gender language, it's, it's not really. But then in medical trials, you, I think it is really, really important to have 
like it delineated to say that this is how a male body will react and this body this is how a female body will react will react and similarly to um you know the the car example we do need to have data on this is how a male body will fare in a car crash and this is how a female body yeah I think so and I think also like physical design because I think that there's obviously a big disparity between you know say even like shelf height like that's designed for the reference man you're mm -hmm. a fellow short girl you know we always struggle with that kind of thing um but you know like there we need to like think about what applications need there to be a difference um and what don't you know so it's it's difficult but um yeah hopefully we can get kind of a clear guidelines around it thank you thank you, thank you, so much you. For the amazing talk thank you